We'll continue with the second half of our day and we'll be hearing from two more speakers. First, we will hear from Dan Kissner, Group Senior Vice President of Pharmacy Solutions at Vizient. With ever-changing market conditions that impact both drug costs and pharmaceutical supply, Dan Kissner leads the Vizient Pharmacy Program, which assists members, member hospitals in transforming their pharmacy program into a central point of integrated care with solutions that help manage cost and improve quality outcomes for patients. Second, we will hear from Aaron Fox, Senior Director of Quality Assurance External Engagement at Procter & Gamble. Aaron serves as Secretary of the P&T Committee and Residency Program Director for the PGY2 Medication Use, Safety, and Policy Residency. Areas of interest include drug shortages, medication use policy, drug information, evidence-based medicine, and drug costs. Aaron frequently serves as a media resource regarding drug shortages and drug prices. Let's turn our attention over Good day, everyone. My name is Dan Kissner, and I am the Group Senior Vice President over Pharmacy at Vizient. And I am so excited to be here today to talk about the Quality Management Maturity Ratings Program and how that can help inform drug purchasing organizations like Vizient as we partner with drug manufacturers to source high-quality, safe, and reliable essential medications that these health systems need every day to care for the patients and their communities. Vizient and the FDA share the same goals. How can we continue to partner to advance quality and avoid these unnecessary drug shortages for patients that we serve? Before we get into the meat of the discussion around the QMM ratings, let me give you a little bit of background on Vizient and why drug shortages and ending drug shortages is so critical to our mission of our company. At Vizient, our core mission is to strengthen members' delivery of high-value care by aligning three core tenets, cost, quality, and market performance. Vizient serves many of the nation's top providers. We represent over 97% of all academic medical centers. We support over 50% of all acute care hospitals in the U.S., along with more than 20% of the ambulatory market. The members we serve are many of the ones that you know, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Mass General, Johns Hopkins, 18 of the top 20 U.S. News and World Report hospitals rely on Vizient for our capabilities in supply chain, pharmacy, ops and quality, and strategic growth for their organizations to drive success. Our pharmacy solutions are centered around the same three core tenets as Vizient when we think about how do we help our members around cost, quality, and market performance in their acute and non-acute pharmacy care settings. Obviously, the core of our program is around our sourcing program. We work with over 3,000 hospitals who aggregate over $90 billion of spend where we partner with drug manufacturers and drug service companies to contract over 12,000 products and services. Beyond just our sourcing efforts, we also help our members through our analytics, our advisory, our clinical insight teams, our network teams, and their ability to expand and maximize many of the non-acute areas like specialty pharmacy, 340B, and pharmacy benefits management. Our health systems have done a heroic effort in the last two years to help fight the pandemic in all of the communities that we live in, but there continue to see pressures especially around cost, as we see, again, another three over 3% inflation for the next year around drugs, and also around drug shortages, which continue to linger decades into the problem. And that's why, again, Vizient's mission is not to prevent drug shortages, it's to end drug shortages. And the key reason is that is because members expect us to play a key role. Seventy-five percent of our directors of pharmacies expect Vizient to help them identify best practices, to manage drug shortages, and seven of the ten expect Vizient to advocate about drug shortages with the industry and with the regulatory environment. So not only is ending drug shortages the right thing to do, it's our expectation, it's a requirement that the members have when they partner with Vizient to be their healthcare performance improvement company. When we think about the overall impact of drug shortages, 
the one that's most obvious and comes to the front of mind for everyone is patient care. We need to make sure at all times that the right patient has the right drug at the right time, all the time. The first-line therapy has to always be available because we know the potential harm and impact it can have when that first-line therapy of an essential life-saving drug isn't readily available. There are, though, other impacts that come from drug shortages, and Vizian actually did a survey in working with our health system to determine the cost of labor, not only in the financial cost, but in the hourly cost. Because what you have today is you have health systems using their top clinicians, their top purchasers, technicians, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, who are wasting millions of hours dialing for drugs, arranging emergency meetings, trying to figure out what they're going to change in their care continuum because they're of a drug shortage. We found actually that the cost per year is over $345 million for clinicians to manage these drug shortages. And how does that break out? It breaks out to over 8 million hours wasted of highly talented patient care advocates, again, just trying to find drugs because they're not readily available to serve the patients in their communities. This impact, along with the most important one around patient care, are so crucial to why we can't prevent drug shortages. We have to end them. At Vizian, we have four key resiliency strategies on how we look at what are we doing to help our members have continual access to essential medications. Well, the first one was identifying them. There are thousands of pharmaceutical products that are available in our country today, but there are some key products that without them, in both an acute and a chronic situation, you could have a detrimental to patient care. What are we doing to drive additional supply into the market? What are we doing to support commitment and transparency? And how can we advocate for better access to life-saving drugs? And I'll tell you, this has been a long journey for us. We have been at this for a long time, and it's consisted all the way back prior to 1990, where we launched Nova Plus, our private label program, up until the early 2000s, where we partnered with the University of Utah and the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, or ASHP, to publish drug shortage information free of charge to the public. We still do this today. To us, establishing our own internal drug shortage task force, we put together many different resources, which we made publicly available, including the drug shortage and labor report I just shared stats on previously, where we created our essential medication drug list, and again, where we continue to evolve many of our sourcing programs like Nova Plus into our Nova Plus Enhanced Supply, what we've done during the pandemic to advocate around getting access to some of these critical COVID-19 drugs, which we saw unprecedented amount of demands on, how we've partnered with other agencies and other corporations who are as passionate about any drug shortages as we are. And finally, where we are today and where we recently most launched the End Drug Shortage Alliance. One thing we believe strongly at Vizient that's core to drug shortages for us is we cannot end them alone. We can't end them alone. There is no one entity that can have all of the solutions because there are so many different reasons for the problem. What we know, though, is that when healthcare systems, supply chain partners, manufacturers, distributors come together and they look to solve a problem like drug shortages, they can do it. And they can do it in a lot of ways around connecting, collaborating, and having that commitment around transparency, redundancy, quality. And what are we doing all around sustaining an additional predict production of additional supply? We now have over 80 different corporations that participate in the End Drug Shortage Alliance all around how do we look at this market differently together? What can we all be doing better together? Whether you're a group purchasing organization, you're a manufacturer, you're a distributor, you're a health system, Anyone that's a key industry stakeholder or an advocate to end drug shortages is welcome to join the Alliance. And I'm excited I'll share later some of the great work that the Alliance is already doing to put an end to drug shortages. Now that we've gone over an overview of getting really busy and the efforts we've had around drug shortages, why are we so excited about the work of the QMM rating system? 
Again, the FISI and the FDA share the same goals. What can we do to advance quality and avoid shortages for patients? Shortages for patients. Well, we know that, again, it starts with essential medications. Our sourcing strategies have always been around what are we doing to prioritize those essential medications. And we, we work with the, our Center for Pharmacy Practice Excellence and our members. These are the top clinicians at over 3,000 hospitals in this country to identify 234 unique drugs in five different categories. These are acute and chronic drugs that have no alternatives. These are high-impact drugs, pediatric impacts, or drugs potentially around antibiotic resistance. We update this quarterly, and a core foundation for us is that we share this publicly. We give this list to anyone who will have it. We forward it on every quarter because we want us to have that foundation of what all of the products we should all be targeting. Every drug's important, but some drugs are more important because of the impact they have on patient care in these life-saving essential situations. That's a data point. The essential medications is a data point in how we source today. What are other data points that Visit continues to push for? Well, one of them that continues to drive transparency is where are all these drugs being manufactured? Where is all the active pharmaceutical ingredient coming from? Where is the finished fill coming from? What can we do to have a database of all of these data points where we can quickly take a look at when a natural disaster is hit or potentially an FDA warning letter? What are we doing to up our game in the round transparency? We now require all of our manufacturers to submit this data if they're going to partner with Vizient. We also are looking at expanding our annual quality attestations from suppliers. And again, we feel strongly that the industry has to, to work towards this collection of this information to make it more efficient, accessible, and more comprehensive. So it starts with what are those essential medications? Now let's get deeper into what is the transparency around them? How do we know where they're made, where they're coming from? And, and again, further along, how do we build to some of the quality data points that are necessary to further our ability to work with and partner with high-quality drug manufacturers. And this is just some insight into when we look at our current manufacturers that we work with today on essential life-saving drugs, where are the, the largest countries that uh, they're sourcing their active pharmaceutical ingredient from, and where are they conducting the majority of their manufacturing or their final fill location. And again, this information is so important to us so that we monitor world events and we monitor, again, what quality events could be happening between the FDA and that manufacturer. Okay, now that we've talked about some of the data points that are very relevant to how Visit works with our supplier partners today, like understanding essential medications, understanding where those drugs are manufactured, where the active pharmaceutical ingredients coming from, let's take a look, closer look into quality. Visiting has actually done two different initiatives in the last year and partnering with different organizations around what can more can we do with our data and with data of other partners that we could drive more understanding and a deeper understanding around quality and the impact it has on the supply chain. One of our partnerships that we're very proud of in the last year is through USP and Angels for Change. As we work together in sharing our data and collaboration of our clinical teams, around identifying those drivers of supply chain resiliency in one of the most critical medication classes there is, pediatric oncology. And again, we work together on a white paper to really show what are those drivers or lack thereof that can really critically impact the supply chain in the pediatric oncolytic space. We also most recently in the last month announced a partnership with RISCS where we are going to do a pilot program it's looking to enhance the assurance of the pharmaceutical supply. We're going to be working together through our data to try to great, great, create greater visibility into the supply chain aspects such as redundancy and raw material supply, available production capacity, and production flexibility, whether it comes to the inventory practices, the location differentiation, or the geopolitical risks. These are both two just identifiers of where Vizian is working with other partners today to try to grow more data points to be relevant as we look to partner with, again, high-quality, safe, and reliable pharmaceutical manufacturers to support our members. So, how could Vizient use the QMM ratings? 
I think the one that comes to mind for us right out the gate is embedding it into our award process. Today, we require manufacturers to submit multiple different data points and metrics as we bid out a product and award a contract to a pharmaceutical manufacturer for our membership. Obviously, something like a rating system around quality could be so crucial in how we evaluate one product to another. We also think that Visi could help partner with the FDA to make some aspect of that quality rating more visible to providers. Providers are just like Visiant, just like the FDA. They want manufacturers, they want to utilize products from manufacturers that are high quality, safe, and reliable. And so giving our purchasers and our buyers at the health systems insight into some aspects of the quality ratings could be very beneficial. We feel strongly that the QMM ratings could help validate or corroborate some of the other quality information that we're receiving from other sources. I just mentioned on the slide before other partners that we're working with, but there are multiple data sources that we bring in-house today that we feel the QMM ratings could help validate and corroborate what we're seeing in the industry. We feel that Visi could help encourage other participation in a particular class of drugs that may be lacking in quality or capacity. So again, where we see potential supply issues today we are always trying to partner more competition in that space. And that's very much something else we could do around quality if we were able to see that a particular drug or class of drugs had a consistent lower quality score and therefore greater competition or participation may be needed. We think the quality rating systems could really help bridge that understanding between providers and that relevance of quality and the needed for investment. So again, there really is no data point today that shows an increase in an investment that a manufacturer may be talking about on what that's doing to increase the quality of that pharmaceutical. And how does that quality of the product translate, therefore, into higher, better patient safety? And will those higher quality products, for example, result in fewer adverse events? Without some of the data points today, there really isn't a way to correlate some of the need for investment to the quality outcomes that we would expect from that investment. Again, the entire health system, just not providers, we all must share in the investment to support improved quality. And so these are just a few ways that we see it being beneficial to visiting and our members, but we know it just would not benefit our providers. It would benefit everyone if we all have this continued investment around improving quality. We do have some questions also related to the implementation of it. So, again, what more can we be doing to encourage or require transparency? I mean, we recently saw a U.S.-based pharmaceutical manufacturer plant that closed. We all received the letter on the same day. And, again, luckily we have entities like the End Drug Shortage Alliance that are working with other partners in their space to identify what drugs are manufactured there, how much of the market share that they have, what are the clinical alternatives. But that level of transparency across quality and supply chain, it needs to be elevated for everyone. Quality needs to be required, but, but when we think about transparency, there has to be more than what we're doing today. And the most recent example of a plant closure in California really highlights that. The implementation of this is going to require significant education and support from the FDA. So, you know, what does a strong rating mean? Um, if it's if it's a lower rating, is that unsafe? What is what's what's the potential impacts of, of using a product as a, a lower rating? What what do we do if all the suppliers have a similar lower rating? You know, trying to understand again what products potentially are being manufactured at a facility or at a line that has a lower rating. You know, what are we doing, all of us, to ensure this increased investment is really translating to true quality improvements? We need to be able to think about when we implement this and we roll this out, how are we drawing that back so we can, again, validate that those higher product costs potentially are translating to true quality improvements? And finally, there's some communication and education considerations that really need to be answered. And again, I don't think any of these are unsolvable, but just given the sensitivity of bringing something like a rating system to market for the first time, we have to ask some of these questions. Questions like, how do we best communicate that a product is safe and efficacious, even if a facility does not receive a high rating? 
how will complaints from providers or consumers be considered? And, and what about the resolution of those complaints? Or, or this one, will the rating system reflect the likelihood that a product is consistently available? These and many others are the right questions to be asking, but I can't state enough how honored Vizian is to be here today, to be on this panel, and how thankful we are for the FDA to continually push around having a more safe, reliable, and high-quality pharmaceutical supply chain. So with that, I know we're going to move into the questions and the discussion for the panel. I look forward to continuing this discussion, and again, we are so appreciative of the FDA and all the partners that are here today that are committed to not preventing drug shortages, but ending drug shortages. Thank you, we'll talk soon. Hi everybody, this is Erin Fox, and I am really happy to be presenting today. Quick disclaimer, this presentation represents my own opinions. I'm not representing the University of Utah or FDA, and our organization is also a member of a GPO, which is called Vizient, and none of those funds are paid directly to me. Quick overview of where we're headed. I want to talk about the state of drug shortages, exactly how health systems are faring right now, and also talk about the latest National Academies of Science report on security of America's medical product supply chain. I was uh, very happy to be a member of that consensus committee. And I also want to talk about exactly how health systems might use a quality rating. What would that look like? So for a quick introduction, shortages in the University of Utah. We have been collecting and monitoring national drug shortage information since 2001. And how we do this is our drug information service, we investigate voluntary reports. So our own health system, we have shortages. And we also get voluntary reports from other health systems. What we do is we contact the manufacturer directly to determine if it's a shortage or not. And if it is a shortage, then we post that up on the website. We also share what we find with FDA, and we recommend alternatives and safety information on exactly how a health system could get through this shortage, just offering suggestions for, for management uh, for those people who are right in the middle of managing a shortage. These are some of the data that we collect. These are posted every quarter on the ASHP website, and these are the most recent data through the first quarter. And each bar represents the number of new shortages that happened during that calendar year. Uh, but this graphic doesn't really tell the whole story, because just because we had, say, 114 new drug shortages in 2021 last year, doesn't mean that they're all resolved as soon as 2022 clicked over, right? There are lingering and ongoing drug shortages. This next graphic really tries to show um, each uh, dot represents a point in time at the end of each quarter of those active and ongoing shortages. So some of these shortages linger on for years, months, and you can see that we have been really above 250 drug shortages for, for quite some time. We had a little dip there, um, but at any given time, there, there are over 200 shortages affecting health systems. So what types of drugs are in short supply? Well, it's, it's really quite, quite a variety. There's no one single category that is affected more than the other. Um, we've got antibiotics, uh, cardiovascular drugs, uh, drugs that affect the central nervous system. That's what CNS is abbreviated there. Uh, fluids and electrolytes are also very problematic. And then hormones is, is a frequent category, as is chemotherapy agents. So why? Uh, you know, I, I did say that there wasn't any single drug category that was most common, but there are common characteristics. And most shortages are of generic products uh, that are injectable. Uh, these products do have some, some characteristics in common as well. They're usually very inexpensive. And, um, you know, the market doesn't really recognize or reward quality, and so the, the prices just keep going lower. Um, and then even if there are companies that would like to produce a drug that's in short supply, there's a long runway to do that. There are definitely regulatory hurdles uh, to overcome, and it can just take a long time. 
Um, I would refer you to the scoping review of the literature that is very, very comprehensive of, of all of the different papers that have been published uh, since 2001 to 2019. But I also want to refer you to FDA's report from their uh, project that they did regarding drug shortages. So this, this was a task force uh, focused on identifying the root causes and solutions for drug shortages. And what FDA found in that report was that most shortages are due to a quality issue. And uh, that's, you know, these, this graphic kind of highlights that, that in about two thirds of the cases, uh, there is a quality issue at hand. And, you know, what is a quality issue? You know, what, what happens? You know, is it just that you didn't, uh, you know, mark down a paper or cross a T or dot an I? Um, I, I want to really highlight that quality issues can harm patients. So let's talk about what happened with Ben Christine in 2019. Uh, in the middle of 2019, Teva discontinued their product. They had very, very small market share. Um, towards the fall uh, of 2019, Pfizer had a quality control issue that they needed to investigate. They didn't feel confident releasing their lots, and so there was a quality hold placed on Ben Christine. Unfortunately, there wasn't safety stock, there wasn't a backup plan, uh, and there was very little communication. Um, basically, uh, health providers, oncologists were told, um, we have no Christine to ship you, and we don't know when we will have product available. Now, luckily, this did resolve, uh, you know, over about two months, but in the meantime, Doctors were rationing care. You know, patients were going without therapy. Uh, imagine being a, a parent of, of a, a child with a curable uh, cancer, and to, to hear that you can't get your child treated is really upsetting and, and very harmful. So delays in therapy can certainly cause harm, but when medications are actually contaminated, they also can cause patient harm. And I just want to highlight this story. Um, it's really easy to, to find this article on, online. It's a, a Kaiser Health News article by Sidney Lepkin. And it really highlights the story of Anderson Moreno. He was ready for a heart transplant, and he received DocuSate solution, a stool softener, that unfortunately was contaminated with Burkholderia subhaitia. And that infection really set him back and took him off of the heart transplant list, and it really delayed the treatment that he needed. So there are actually really severe patient consequences. Patients actually died from that contamination as well. So it's not just maybe a delay in therapy, maybe a shortage. There's actual patient harm from these contaminated products. And I want to show you what, what that kind of looked like from a hospital perspective. So these are uh, just some screen grabs of the MedWatch alerts that, that came through. Uh, my drug information team or our supply team was watching these very carefully. And the first one that we saw um, said, you know, don't use any liquid products by, you know, Pharmatech and distributed by Rugby and possibly other companies. And it was that possibly other companies that really kept me up that night and, and really all of the rest of the nights until we got to September uh, when we identified all of the potential products that were contaminated. I remember talking with our hospital epidemiologists about this recall, about this, this risk for these products, and they said, Erin, just make sure we have everything off of the shelves. And I had to explain to them that I couldn't because we didn't have the full list. And they said, well, just call the company and, and ask them to tell you all of the products that they make uh, that, that could be at risk. So um, I did that, of course. Uh, we certainly contacted Pharmatech and asked them to please provide us the list. We know there's a recall. We know there's a contamination. We want to be sure we don't have any contaminated products on our shelves. And we were unable to get that list because it is apparently a trade secret. So... I want to talk about what happens when a shortage occurs. So, you know, that was kind of an extreme recall situation there with the DocuSate. But unfortunately, shortages are happening very frequently. And it's very invisible work by the pharmacy department in many cases. But I want to go through some of the steps so you have that background. 
Basically, pharmacy treats us as an emergency. How much do we have? How long will it last? Can we make it last longer? And what else can we buy? And as we're working through those questions, we're also simultaneously working with clinicians to think about management plans, thinking about alternatives, and also thinking about rationing patient care. So it really uh, requires people to think uh, with, with very complex problem-solving capabilities. So you need to think about the clinical impact. What is the best clinical thing you can do for patients at your health system? But you also have to think very carefully about the operational impact. Uh, you have to think about, can you implement this in your electronic health record? How difficult will it be? Um, are you going to have to re-enter orders for, say, 600 patients because uh, you just uh, lost a, a very critical medication? At the center of it, you have to, of course, think about the patient impact and do what is best for the patients. Uh, but there's there's often a fair amount of tension between what is clinically the best for patients, but then what you're actually able to do logistically. Uh, you simply may not have enough people uh, to accomplish what you need to do, or the electronic uh, health record may not uh, allow you to do that or in a timely fashion. So let's talk about some of the challenges in implementing these, these plans to mitigate the harm of a drug shortage. So we have a lot of automation in healthcare, and this is very good because it does help keep patients safe. There's barcode scanning. Uh, there are automated dispensing cabinets to make sure that the medications are in the right place at the right time. Unfortunately, all of that automation really depends on having the same product all of the time, same, same NDC, uh, same kind of formulation in, in a vial or a syringe, uh, same barcode. When there's a change, that requires work. We also have to think about the electronic health record and the changes that you might need to make to implement a mitigation plan take a lot of time. Uh, for example, uh, I remember when we had a shortage of morphine and we couldn't get the pre-filled Carpujex syringes, but we were able to get small vials. The great thing about that was clinically, these products were the exact same for the patient. Uh, it was the same concentration. Uh, it, it didn't have any any other clinical differences except one was in a vial and one was in a Carpujex syringe. But because of those presentation differences, it required extraordinary work on the part of our pharmacy informatics team to make those changes in our electronic health record. And so, you know, the other part of this is that, you know, the automation and the electronic health record doesn't always see products as, as clinically equivalent. And so that, that example about, uh, you know, the, the morphine, another example is when we had a shortage of saline bags and we had to prepare dexamethasone in a syringe instead of an infusion bag, uh, that took an incredible amount of time uh, to re-enter orders on therapy plans uh, to make sure that those patients were, were still going to get the product that they needed, um, but an extraordinary amount of work. So all of that to really protect the patient, uh, make sure that they're getting their the products that they need, but it's a tremendous amount of work that takes away from whatever those pharmacists and technicians should be doing uh, with their time normally. And, and that staffing is, is absolutely key. Um, with the great resignation, most health systems are significantly short-staffed. Um, it is very difficult to hire technicians that you need to do all of this work. Um, and that's that's just one other challenge that is that is certainly on top of everything right now. So what can we do to improve resilience? I want to ask a quick poll question. Is onshoring the answer for drug shortages? And so put in your answer and we'll talk about it during the panel. So I'm excited to see the results during the panel, but just to throw this in for food for thought, uh, I will say that most shortages of injectable generic products that have occurred and were very severe for health systems over the past uh, years 
have been due to quality problems at factories already inside the United States. So with improving resiliency, one of the things that actually came out of COVID was the CARES Act. And the CARES Act was so large, uh, it's, it's easy to lose sight of some of the things that, that were included there. But we actually got many things related to drug shortages in that legislation. So, for example, uh, drug suppliers are now required to give more shortage reasons to the FDA. Um, before this, uh, suppliers didn't even have to always give FDA the true reason or an expected duration of how long a shortage would last. Uh, more about learning more about our APIs, our, our raw materials, use of um, contract manufacturing organizations or CMOs. All of these things in the CARES Act were really put there to try to help improve resiliency and, and to improve the, the shortage situation. Um, for example, you know, having a business continuity plan. Certainly every single hospital across the country must have uh, a continuity plan, an emergency plan uh, to continue to provide services in, in any um, emergency. That's not the case with uh, a drug supplier providing a critically life-saving product. There is no guarantee that that product will be available at any time. So one of the items out of the CARES Act was that um, the National Academies of Science should conduct a study on building resilience into the nation's medical supply product chains. You can get the full report available online. Uh, you don't want to read all 360 pages of it. You can also get a short highlights page, um, and there's also a recorded presentation that's available for, for you to see. But again, I'm very, very honored and proud to have been a part of this consensus committee. We had a really nice variety of, of people on this committee, ranging from economists uh, to people who specialize in supply chain to physicians, uh, folks who have been um, experienced in different parts of government uh, and uh, economists. It was, it was just an extraordinary committee of, of people with a very, very diverse experience. And one of the things that we did uh, was in our report, we really kind of distilled this down into a framework to think about how we can improve resiliency. And at the foundation is awareness. Um, and then you can think of mitigation, preparedness, and response as shields that, that could guard against a trigger event. And so let's say uh, a trigger event happens um, and it might get through the mitigation shield, but the preparedness shield might stop it. The other thing to think about is in uh, a scarce resource situation, you know, we do not have unlimited funding. Um, it's important to think about uh, how, how each of these foundational items start to escalate in cost. So, for example, you know, awareness doesn't necessarily cost a great deal. Uh, mitigation member measures are, are expensive. Uh, but they're not as expensive as stockpiling and creating additional manufacturing lines for capacity buffering. That starts to get really expensive. And by the time we're at response where, where patients could, could be harmed, we're, we're very, very into um, expensive measures to take. Again, uh, the full recommendations are, are available. I will not read these to you, but quickly to summarize, the Awareness Foundation really relies on transparency and making steps to make all of the sourcing and quality information publicly available. In addition, we need that publicly available information to actually be usable uh, in, a, in a usable format. And so we need a publicly accessible database. Um, FDA could, could certainly do that. Um, but by making a publicly accessible database, this, this could also offer third party companies the chance to go in and, and help provide more awareness around the transparency and for products. Now, Mitigation um, is really all about resilience contracting. And so once we have those ratings, uh, then what we should do is go ahead and, and use them. And health systems should use them in their contracting. And accreditation organizations should rate health systems on their use of those. 
When we talk about preparedness, we're talking about potential stockpiling, capacity buffering, again, having those readiness measures ready to go and, uh, you know, really improving the overall stockpiling efforts to have a better preparedness measure. And then response is, is really about last mile solutions, ensuring that those who are most at need can access the product and that we have formalized allocation and rationing strategies for everyone to use, not just health systems with, with a lot of resources. And then the last bit, because our supply chains are very global, uh, that actually requires action across global borders. And so we recommended uh, negotiating a plurilateral treaty uh, that could prevent companies from um, and countries from export bans for, for critically needed supplies. So how could a health system utilize a rate? So currently hospitals uh, have no idea who is making the products that they're purchasing and if there are any quality differences between one supplier or another, we have a pass-fail system. It's either on the market or not. Uh, suppliers do not share uh, the list of products made at a manufacturing site. They do not share the source of raw materials. And when you look at a product and the name of that, that company that is listed on the product may not even be the company that made that product because of contract manufacturing. So basically, price is the only differentiation point. So the idea is, if quality was more transparent, if suppliers would have to show their, their quality, then we could target our dollars, our purchasing dollars, towards those companies who are doing a better job. Now, why would I want to spend more on a product uh, that has a higher quality? Well, hopefully it won't be contaminated with bacteria. Uh, it'll have a much more resilient supply chain, and, you know, we, we won't see those recalls as frequently. So while there is no incentive uh, to be transparent, there's no incentive to, to have high quality. And so that's really uh, the, the argument be behind this and, and of course, um, incorporated into our National Academies of Science study. So with quality ratings, it's going to require a mindset change for health systems that paying more will, will be difficult, but health systems need to realize that we are already paying more, but we are paying more by paying overtime to our technicians, uh, by not having products available, by delaying treatments and delaying procedures. Um, we, we are already paying more, and, and patients are paying the cost of that. Um, but certainly I would not like to pay more without some assurance of quality ratings or, or, or supply assurance. And we really have to, have to figure out that, that balance. Um, but with quality visibility, we should, we should pay more for, for that quality. So just a couple final thoughts here. Um, we know FDA does see clear differences between products, but in general, they're, they're not allowed to disclose those differences. They're not allowed to tell, tell me, tell purchasers who uh, are, are spending the most money on these drugs which product might be better? Which is a better choice? I don't know. They're both uh, FDA approved and on the market. Um, I would love to know which company is truly investing in their quality systems so that they're not going to have contaminated products and they're not going to have uh, shortages. Quality ratings can really allow health systems to reward those companies, reward the companies that are doing the work to improve their quality. And the other issue to really target quality is that we know from, from FDA's own study that quality issues are a key reason for shortages. And so by incentivizing quality, we are aiming at one of the biggest root causes of, of drug shortages. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and I look forward to speaking on the panel. Thanks very much. Feel free to reach out if, if I can be of any assistance. Thank you, Erin, and thank you, Dan, for your presentations. Hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Fucas. I'm the Associate Director for Communication in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality. So I would like to welcome you all to this um, last panel session in this QMM workshop. In addition to Dan Kistner and Erin Fox, who just presented, we are inviting back Ashley Bohm, who is the Director of the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality. 
you may recall her presentation from yesterday. And Adam Fisher, who is the director of the scientific staff in the immediate office for the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. So welcome to all of you. Let's kick this off with the first question here directed to Dan. If QMM becomes adopted by FDA, can you provide insight regarding how purchasing contracts would change to reflect the increased emphasis on QMM? Would you be willing to pay more for the same drug from a manufacturer if the QMM score is slightly or significantly higher than a competitor's drug? Hi, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again uh, for allowing us to have this opportunity to meet today. It's been a great session so far. And uh, regarding the question, you know, for Vizient today, as we go to bid in the market uh, for our membership on any essential medication, you know, we work very closely with our members on deciding what are the criteria, what are we trying to measure? And that can include price, redundancy, resiliency, and other data points or metrics. You know, having something like a quality rating could be just another one of those data points that we put into that process. Health systems want to have safe, we all want safe and effective medications. And we have seen time and time again, unfortunately, primarily in drug shortages, that purchasers will pay more for supply, prioritize supply, in particular around these essential drugs. But today, there really is no link to what paying more does and how that increased cost is leading to that higher quality. So if something like the rating system was in place, it would allow purchasers to have that insight and it would influence their purchasing decision. And, and you just heard, again, you know, we're so lucky to have Aaron Fox here today. You just heard Aaron Fox echo that in her presentation just a few moments ago. Thanks, Dan. So then following up with Aaron on that topic, why do you, why do health systems make most purchasing decisions based on price, and would health systems pay more for higher quality products? So, honestly, the only thing that health systems have to make a purchase decision on is price. We have virtually no information about where a product is made, um, you know, what the quality of that manufacturing facility is, because all of that is considered a proprietary secret. And so really it's like shopping on Amazon online with nothing but prices. That's, that's literally all we have. Um, you know, if something is FDA approved, uh, we, we assume that all products are equal. And we know that FDA doesn't see those products as equal, uh, but that's exactly why we need uh, a quality rating system. Thanks, Aaron. Back to Dan. Are anti-epileptics considered essential medicines? And where can we find the list you men mentioned for essential medications? Yeah, that's a great question, Kristen. Yes, they are. We do have uh, many anti-epileptics that are currently considered essential medications and on our list. Uh, I believe we posted in the chat uh, where it can be found. I, I want to make this you know, really clear. We make this a public, this is a document that's behind no firewall. It's available to everyone in the public. Uh, this is a document we share with all of our members. I know we've shared in the past with the FDA and other agencies. Uh, and we update this document quarterly and continue to update this as we see uh, changing needs in healthcare and how patients are treated or where we've seen, again, uh, maybe a new type of product or category be disrupted around supply and what that's done to impact patient care. So yes, anti epileptics are considered essential medications and we'll post a link to the document. And like I said, we update it quarterly and would encourage all of us uh, to take a look at it. Thank you, Dan. Now another question for Aaron. Um, per your slide, you were saying that most shortage, shortages are, are for generic and injectables that are associated with quality issues. Or are these two issues separate? That's a great question, and I'm, I'm really glad I get to clarify this. Most drug shortages are generic injectable products, and those are the shortages that are affecting hospitals every day and the shortages that uh, Dan talked about in his presentation that are causing so much of the labor problems. Um, it is very, very rare to have a shortage of a branded product unless it is made by a contract manufacturer. Um, and then, you know, separately, the reason behind most shortages, at least from, from the data that, that FDA has provided, because manufacturers aren't required to tell us uh, what, what is a shortage or not, um, is that it's a quality issue behind, that is driving those drug shortages. So again, you know, the, the typical drug shortage is something that's used in a hospital, it's an injectable, and uh, there's usually only one or two suppliers of, of that product, and that's, that's where we're at. 
Thanks, Aaron. Let's see if we can pull up your poll question now and get some feedback from the audience on that. Let's wait a second and see if it comes up. While we are waiting, um, I will toss another question to you, Aaron, and also to Ashley. Significant investment often goes into developing capability and quality mindset as CMOs, which is considered to be proprietary information as well as competitive advantage. Why wouldn't making QMM ratings and supply chain information for products that utilize CMOs disincentivize this investment? So this is Erin, and, and I'll certainly just let, let Ashley uh, address the very technical specifics. She's, she's absolutely expert. But I do want to say that our situation right now, no other product that we buy is, has so much secrecy around it besides medications. Uh, think about purchasing a computer or even a piece of clothing. You are allowed to know where that product was made. And we do not have that with, with our drugs. And so um, whatever we can do to remove those secrets and have more transparency will hopefully incentivize more manufacturers to improve their quality. And the, the end result will be fewer shortages, fewer recalls, and fewer impacts to patients. Thanks, Erin. And this is Ashley. Um, I'm glad that this question was asked because I wanted to clarify that, you know, what FDA would be looking for um, is not the specifics um, and not, not to share specifics of how a particular manufacturer has developed its quality system um, and has developed its quality culture and all of those elements that go into a higher level of quality management maturity. We're looking to assess that you have implemented those, um, they are effective, uh, and then provide a uh, um, an assessment that feeds into an overall rating that reflects that. Um, so what, you know, in, in terms of the rating, it's not about the specifics um, the, of what you've done in terms of the information that would, you would consider to be proprietary, but it's the outcomes of having made those investments that we had done an assessment and we have seen that higher level of maturity in operation there uh, in your facility. So our hope is that actually this would incentivize um, this investment because it's that output uh, that is what we're looking for, that you have put in place um, different approaches to increase your quality management maturity, and, and we're seeing the output of that. So I hope that helps. The and, and Ashley, if I could just add on to that, yesterday we had a poll where we asked about the potential benefits to uh, manufacturers who adopt QMM ratings, and one was improved supply chain insight related to contract manufacturers and API suppliers. So I do think there are some benefits there to go around. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Ashley. We will um, go back to Ashley with an ICHQ Q10 question. Both risk and knowledge management are enablers of the PQS and also critical to mature QMS. I see training, knowledge transfer as a critical component of ensuring these enablers work well, yet I don't see the emphasis on effective training programs in the industry. What are your thoughts on what an effective training program can do in driving the maturity of a quality system? Thanks for that question, uh, Kristen. So I uh, absolutely agree with the person who wrote this question that um, risk and knowledge management are, uh, are key aspects of Q10. Uh, a couple of ways that training feeds into uh, quality management maturity. Uh, one is to help folks at all level levels of the organization understand the importance of quality. And more specifically, understand how the piece that, that they play, the role that they play, um, then can have an impact on the ultimate product that gets to the patient and that patient's experience. Um, and so that's a, an important piece of building that quality culture. Um, also, uh, training can be very important to uh, help reinforce um, the importance of staff at all levels feeding back information, um, identifying where there are things that might be uh, near misses, um, in the day-to-day -day operations where they see opportunities for improvement to make uh, processes more efficient, 
Um, certainly, in many cases, it's the folks doing the day-to-day -day work that have the best ideas for how to make it better. And so training can be an important part of reinforcing that a uh, an organization with a quality, a good quality culture um, reinforces that um, ground up feedback um, and that that is welcomed um, and, and not penalized, but welcomed and then hopefully acted upon. So just a couple of thoughts there. Thanks for that question. And maybe you want to go to the results of the poll here, Kristen. Looks pretty. Yes, thanks, Ashley. So um, here are the results to the poll question. Is onshoring the answer for drug shortages? Um, it is not. Um, it's more than half voted no, 41% with maybe, and 6% with yes. Aaron, would you like to discuss these results? Were they what you expected? You know, um, I, I didn't have anything in mind. Um, I'm interested. I get different responses uh, whenever I, I kind of ask people this question. But I think this group is very astute in, in these votes uh, because I, I think, you know, we're somewhere in the middle between no and maybe, honestly. Um, I think everyone recognizes how global our supply chains are. And even if we were able to make every single thing into the, in the United States, which, which is very likely impossible, um, we would, you know, potentially have our own supply chain shortages. For example, you know, if Puerto Rico, uh, we, we have, we've had hurricanes. Uh, Texas has frozen over solid. Uh, so it's, it's good to have redundancy and contingency plans in place regardless of where the supply chain is. Just making something in the United States is, I do not believe is the answer for drug shortages. Thanks, Aaron. What about from the FDA perspective, Adam? Any thoughts here? Yes, absolutely. I think given the complexity of the pharmaceutical market, there really won't be one solution for drug shortages. Uh, the agency has a drug shortage report that has some solutions in it. Uh, QMM ratings that we're discussing here today is a potential solution. I think an objective analysis of the pharmaceutical market would say that onshoring maybe an answer for drug shortages, but it's certainly not the only answer uh, to drug shortage. Thanks, Adam. I have another one for the FDA folks. Ashley and Adam, understanding that CM benefits, ha C continuous manufacturing has benefits in terms of addressing quality and scale up. There are other concerns su such as the creation of patent and economic barriers for certain sectors of the pharma industry, like generics or small business concerns. Can you speak a little more to how FDA is addressing this concern? Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, I'll start and then uh, and then toss it over to, to Adam. Um, so I wanted to address a couple of things that are buried in this question. So one is uh, a question about potential creation of patent uh, barriers. And so I wanted to, to second the record straight. We've heard some concerns from folks that um, that there would be concern that if, for example, an innovator product was manufactured using a continuous manufacturing process, for example, that there would be an expectation that the generic to that innovator product would have to do the same. And that is not the case. Um, the manufacturing process used to produce a product is not uh, an element of establishing sameness in order to approve a generic. Um, we do think there are real benefits to advanced manufacturing techniques such as CM, um, but it's it's not required, and there's certainly not a barrier posed there by having an innovator product use it um, to, to produce the, the reference listed drug. Um, the other thing is that uh, there's been some recent uh, research um, that has been conducted by FDA and shared in a paper that I think Adam will probably speak to, um, where we went to look at what are the potential uh, economic benefits and any particular concerns about um, use of continuous manufacturing. And so maybe I'll turn it over to you, Adam, to speak more to that. Yes, thank you, Ashley. And I will acknowledge that continuous manufacturing is a little outside the scope of this workshop, but I think Ashley explained very well yesterday the relationship between several of the FDA initiatives, including the quality management maturity ratings that we're talking about here, and but also advanced manufacturing, and certainly continuous manufacturing is one of the more popular types of advanced manufacturing in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I would just echo what Ashley said. There's no reason that a generic manufacturer would need to adopt continuous manufacturing just because an, an innovator has done so. Specifications are based on relevance to the patient and not on process capability. 
So that is a misconception that we do hear from time to time. So I, I did want to make sure that we emphasize that. And then Ashley did mention a brand new paper that we have out. We did a self audit of the regulatory submissions that included uh, continuous manufacturing in the US. Uh, and we found some surprising results. Uh, primarily, uh, we found that applications using continuous manufacturing were actually approved faster uh, that's when we measured by either the mean or the median from the time of submission. They were actually approved faster than the applications that used traditional batch manufacturing technologies. Uh, we also looked at some other factors such as inspection, um, post-approval changes, and things along those lines. Uh, and we really didn't see any significant barriers that would uh, prohibit someone from seeking to adopt continuous manufacturing if, if they were so inclined to do so. So I, I would definitely point folks to that paper. It uh, came out very recently online in the International Journal of Pharmaceutics. Thanks, Adam. Now um, back to Dan and Aaron. The polls on day one showed that very few audience members found incentives from, purchase, from purchasers to be the key benefit to manufacturers receiving QMM ratings. Why do you think that is? Aaron, I could kick it off if you'd like. I, I think you said it really well earlier. I think that, again, I, I don't think that purchasers today have ever had those data points to even consider. So I wouldn't be surprised, Kristen, to hear that there were a few audience members that felt that that could be valuable because we just haven't had that type of transparency in the past, that ty those types of data points to draw from. We know that as we see more and more transparency, in particular over the last few years, that type of data information is so important to purchasers. When we don't have that type of information and data, that clarity, that transparency, the only thing that could exist is nothing or even sometimes, unfortunately, chaos. And so I would say that I, I, I'm not surprised to hear that very few would find it to be valuable, but I can tell you it would be extremely valuable. And I think that that reception and that response comes from uh, years, decades of that type of information and analysis being available in the market to see how purchasers were, would respond. Aaron, what are your sure. thoughts? You know, I, I couldn't have said it any better myself, Dan, but I think you know, when I saw that poll yesterday, I, I honestly wasn't surprised either. Um, you know, there's just no way to, to use that information or, or have it um, available when you're making a purchase right now. The one thing that I really liked earlier today in the panel was Clifford's presentation about how much companies themselves benefit on their own from productivity and internal benefits when they improve their, their quality. And so, you know, that's encouraging to me as well. Maybe if companies don't want to do it, um, you know, to, to provide information to purchasers, maybe they'll want to, to do it to improve their, their overall productivity. Thank you both. Now for Aaron, if QMM data becomes publicly available, should it be available for the general public or only to healthcare providers? In addition, what are your thoughts regarding health systems using products from sites with lower QMM scores, even if the products are sole sourced? That's a great question. You know, I think it would be very difficult to keep it a secret um, with only healthcare providers able to have access to that information. Um, I, I firmly believe that those data should be transparent. Uh, that's also what our uh, National Academy of Science consensus report recommends is full transparency. And so, you, you know, with, without that, um, it is very difficult to, um, to, to make those changes. And I, I, I didn't get the last part of your question, Kristen. Um, FDA's, oops, sorry, let me back up here. Um, in addition, what are your thoughts regarding health systems using products from sites with lower QMM scores, even if the products are sole source? Yes, so this is where full transparency is really a benefit because if only some companies are, are you know, have a rating and other companies don't, then health systems are put in a, in a difficult position of, of knowing exactly what to use. If everything is transparent, if everything has a rating, uh, then, then everyone understands what, what products are being used. Um, you could imagine that perhaps payers might want to get involved 
And, um, you know, if peers perhaps uh, only reimbursed for a certain level of quality, uh, that really may drive the market to improve. I think it would be difficult to have to use a, a product that you know is poor quality, but hopefully it would at least meet uh, the FDA approved standard. And, and if it doesn't, then it certainly shouldn't be on the market. Uh, so I think the quality ratings really help us differentiate when there are two products uh, that look the same. How do we know which one to purchase? Which company deserves uh, our dollars and how do we incentivize that company to keep on investing in their quality? Thanks, Aaron. Now we're going back to Ashley. Stakeholders talk about quality as product quality, not just supply chain robustness. FDA stated QMM ratings will be about supply chain robustness, not product quality. How do you reconcile this apparent disconnect? Thanks, Kristen, for this question, because this can be uh, somewhat confusing, and it's one of the um, points that we are thinking about very carefully in terms of how we communicate about this program. Um, so, uh, yes, the products that are on the market uh, are expected to be of appropriate quality. Um, that means meeting all of our expectations for uh, quality such that, um, as Dr. Kopchak explained yesterday, um, the you know, patients can expect to receive the clinical benefits that are described in the label, um, whether it's their first dose or their last dose of that medication. So we expect that all of the product that's on the market is of appropriate quality. What this is about is about supply chain robustness and ensuring that when patients need that product, that quality product, it will be available to them. And so that's really our focus is on ensuring that product that meets FDA's quality expectations is not only on the market, but available consistently uh, for patients that need it. Thanks. And, and Ashley, if I could, I'd love to ask a follow-on question for, for Dan and Aaron related to this. So we've talked about sites having QMM ratings, and they've talked about uh, they've talked about how they purchase products. So I guess my question to Dan and Aaron is, do you feel you have the information you need to link the supply chain QMM ratings to the products that you purchase? And if not, what additional information do you feel you need? Aaron, would you like to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll start it off. I do not, Adam. Um, you know, I, I cannot get a list of all of the products that are made in a particular facility. Um, even when there's a, a horrible recall at that facility, I still I can't always get a list of, of all of those potentially impacted products. Um, so it is very difficult to, to link things to, to a manufacturing facility rating if I don't know what is made in that facility. Um, so at a minimum, um, you know, I, I need a per product rating or I need to be able to track it back and, and have a good understanding of which products are, are coming out of that facility that has a specific quality rating. I'd rather not have to do all that work. I mean, this whole thing, you know, I just want to say out loud, I honestly wouldn't care where all of these products were made or, uh, you know, what the quality was if we had access to a consistent and quality supply for our patients. If I could purchase the drugs that I need every day for our health system, I would not need these ratings, but we desperately do need them because of the way our supply chain is right now. Yeah, Aaron's absolutely right, Adam. And again, I think we, we have been, and, and again, learned a lot from, Aaron mentioned the hurricane of Puerto Rico. Uh, years ago. Uh, obviously, it was a terrible, catastrophic event um, for all those that lived in Puerto Rico, but we also saw an IV shortage that we've never seen before, IV solution shortage, and we all held our breath wondering what other facilities and plants were on the island of Puerto Rico where we were going to potentially see a, a drug shortage. So since then, you know, we have asked and required uh, data points around where products are coming from and where they're being manufactured in API, et cetera, that I think would be helpful, Adam. But I think as QMM comes to life, I think we'd have to do a, a, a li links between those data points to see what additional information would be necessary and what, if anything, was still missing. Um, but Aaron said it extremely well. Okay, thank, thank you, Dan and Aaron. That's very, very interesting to hear. You know, I did just want to clarify a point here related to the supply chain information. Uh, I, I often find a misconception is that the FDA has more supply chain information than we actually do. There's certainly gaps in our supply chain understanding. 
In some cases, we've relied on information given voluntarily to us by purchasers so that we could understand supply chains, in particular in the recent past year, supply chains that have been impacted by COVID. Uh, and in other cases, we purchase uh, market data, but there are certainly limitations in that data that we can purchase as well. Uh, there are examples when there can be multiple active API manufacturers for a certain product named in an application. Um, issues knowing the amount released for commercial distribution, although we're just gaining this type of information, and then certainly distribution data as well. And I would just say that we're working to further our own understanding, uh, but we are only at the beginning of, of getting volume data now. And we do have some guidance out recently related to volume reporting, also risk management plans and so on. Thanks, Adam. And everyone, I think we have time for one last question, which will be a nice way to end um, not only this panel, but also the whole workshop. Ashley and Adam, what exactly will FDA gain by having industry implement QMM, and how will FDA measure the success of the initiative? Hi, Kristen. Uh, thanks for the question. Boy, I could talk about that for a long time, but I'll try to be quick since we're running out of time. Um, what we're hoping is that um, having this QMM program will allow FDA through the program to help uh, manufacturers to do basically self-improvement. Um, we'll help them be able to identify where there are additional opportunities to increase the maturity of their quality management system, um, and that will help them be more efficient um, in their in their manufacturing processes. Um, we hope that overall, that the more uh, manufacturers that participate, uh, we'll see improved QMM that will lead to fewer supply disruptions, um, not only uh, because of quality issues, but, but by having things in place like risk management, that um, when we do see things like the hurricane in Puerto Rico, firms will be better prepared um, and we'll see uh, fewer disruptions that come from those types of events. Um, there's a lot more to say there, but uh, I know we're running out of time. So um, I'll just close by saying, you know, the, the, the feedback and the questions we've received during the, the conference the last these two days have been super helpful. Um, and just to let folks know, um, we are in the process of building this program. So there have been a number of questions asking, you know, are you going to rate me next week? Um, no, we're not. Um, we are using this input from this workshop um, and hopefully from an advisory committee meeting to follow um, to really help us build the program. We'll continue to have additional stakeholder engagement. Um, so you'll see more from us before we kick anything off. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Ashley. I'd like to... Um... Thank Dan, Aaron, Ashley, and Adam for participating in this um, discussion. We appreciate your feedback on all of the questions, and we thank the audience for providing all of the questions. Um, and I would like to toss it back to Dr. Mike Opsha for a closing remark. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. I appreciate that. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I, I am about the last two days. Uh, there was, you know, uh, uh, excellent presentations. Uh, excellent questions and discussions, panel discussions and all that. Um, so I hope you really enjoyed it as much as I did. I found it, as uh, Ashley had mentioned, uh, very engaging and very uh, heartening uh, that we had that kind of participation and engagement over the last two days. And this will really help us then forge this program going forward. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity now to thank the diverse group and engaged stakeholders who presented and participated in these discussions. Uh, over the last two days for this workshop. I know a lot of time and attention went into that, so thank you so much uh, for making it the success that it was. At the start of this event, if you can remember, I highlighted OPQ's ongoing efforts to incentivize mature quality management practices. One thing that I hope you appreciated over the last two days about this workshop is that we wanted it to be an authentic engagement on our QMM program. Uh, this is something that was very important when we put this program together uh, you know, uh, amongst my leadership team and the staff that actually helped us uh, support this, this workshop. Uh, we didn't want you to hear from FDA speakers ad nauseum about how important we think the program is and how great it will be. Uh, we really wanted it to be an authentic discussion. Um, we acknowledge that our QMM program will impact a broad swath of uh, stakeholders. And that's evident, obviously, by the diverse audience that attended this workshop. And we really wanted this to be reflected by the participants in the workshop. So we did that intentionally. Over the last two days, you heard some voices from outside the agency, even some that are critical of some of the things that we do. And again, this was done by design. Uh, it's not always uh, comfortable for us or for any of us 
to hear criticism publicly, uh, but it is necessary. It is a necessary part of authentically engaging with stakeholders, and that's really what we wanted to do. And hopefully, that came across at this workshop. Uh, as they say, you don't have to take criticism personally, but you should always take it seriously. And it can be the most valuable commodity that we come across. Um, so again, while it may be difficult for us to hear some of this publicly, we do take it seriously. We really do appreciate the candidness of the audience to kind of share those comments and share those views with us. Um, there are plenty of other forums where we could all go and sit around and blame each other for causing drug shortages. Unfortunately and inevitably, Forums focused on blame always stop short of identifying practical solutions to uh, improve the supply chain. And our intent here is really to improve the supply chain. So what I'm interested in is not blaming one another, but rather working together. And this is a philosophy that I have, my leadership team has, that all of us at OPQ have. And we really drive and strive to, to do that. Uh, and hopefully that was reflected in this workshop. We really want to develop solutions that will lead to more resilient uh, drug supply chains because ultimately our focus is on the patient and the consumer of the products that, that are uh, uh, out there on the market. So I'd like to kind of switch gears a little bit just to let you know I'm grateful for you, the audience, for participation in this workshop. Obviously, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was without you. Thank you for taking the time from all over the world to join us over these past two days. Uh, we've captured all of your questions, and we know there are a lot of questions as well as comments. Uh, regardless of whether you were able, to, well, we were able to address them in the panel discussions or not, uh, we do appreciate them because we'll continue to help inform our uh, decisions going forward for the QMM program. I do want to share with you uh, two things that I heard uh, uh, or that I saw in your polls, which provided some surprising insights to me personally. Uh, the first is the overwhelming positive responses indicating that purchaser, purchasers should consider QMM ratings and that they will improve their decision making, yet barely, barely over half thought that ratings would lead to reduced drug shortages. Uh, this is something to consider as we further develop this program, so uh, that was a nice learning for me. Uh, the other was that by far most of the audience found the biggest potential benefit to participants in a QMM program to be the following, and that is identifying opportunities for continual improvement. This warms the cockles of my heart. Yes, as, as, as some of my staff will tell you, I actually do have a heart. Uh, as the QMM program uh, is innovated for FDA in the sense that it is proactive and rewarding rather than reactive and punitive. I know, you know, sometimes when you think about the FDA, you think about inspections, and, you know, they can be punitive uh, uh, in, in terms of their scope. But this program, we really want to be proactive and rewarding folks for that really go the extra to, to bring quality into their manufacturing sites. Um, so as, um, uh, you know, as we move this forward, please keep that in mind. That's really what our focus is and needs to be. Uh, so we want to encourage uh, more and punish less, uh, I guess is the easiest way for me to put that. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge the staff at the FDA who are supporting the development of the QMM program. I can't tell you how much time, effort, and work they've put into this. They've presented this at the various levels all the way up to the commissioner level about what we're doing here so that they're informed and, and well aware of our, our approach to, to bringing this hopefully to fruition um, in the not too distant future. I want to give a special thanks to Brenda Stoddard as well as Jeff Ke uh, Kelly and everyone who supports SBIA for their excellent running of this event. I'm always amazed and impressed at how they keep all the pieces in the air and they actually are able to, to pull this off and it seems so seamless because they do such a great job. Um, as someone myself who chose to dedicate myself to public service after working in the private sector for so long, I acknowledge that each of us could have chosen something different to do with our time, life, as well as our careers. I believe, though, that we work in public service because we want to make a difference. I know I do, and it's one of the reasons why I came to the FDA. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lot different for me. Uh, it took me a bit to, to kind of learn the ins and outs, but I have a great staff that has supported me to be able to make that transition. Um, and all of us really are driven by the mission, uh, you know, to make this a better place, to really uh, uh, focus on getting and keeping quality medicines for patients as well as consumers. It is our goal to make a difference, a positive difference, uh, obviously. Uh, then in my eyes, our QMM program has the potential to make a significant positive impact uh, going forward. So I want to thank, uh, give a thank you to all of my staff at the FDA 
for your continued dedication to this and um, uh, hopefully the support of all of you outside the FDA to bring this to fruition and, and make it, you know, uh, you know, make it what it needs to be to really drive quality in the industry. So what I ask is let's maintain the momentum that we've cultivated at this workshop and let's see each other again, as Ashley had mentioned, at our next public event. We're hoping to have an advisory committee meeting around QMM. So please stay tuned for more details on that as we put that together. In the meantime, uh, let's continue uh, playing our respective parts, ensuring that safe, effective quality drugs are available to the patients and consumers who need them when they need them. So with that, I, I close the uh, workshop, but I would like to turn it back over to Renew for her closing, uh, her closing housekeeping uh, remarks. So uh, Renew, back to you.